Greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me on this Bible study of uh, the book of Romans. Uh, as you can see, we're in uh, Romans chapter 1, going into chapter 2. Today, uh, our session is entitled Our Common Condition, Part 1. Um, just to give you a, um, a review, uh, this is the third video in a many video series. I'm not sure how many videos it's going to end up being. Uh, video one is the introduction on the book of Romans. It gives you uh, historical context, background, and it gives you the, uh, the tools that you'll need in your tool belt, belt to read Romans. The last video, which was session one or something like that, or session two, uh, that was the um, first, uh, first chapter of Romans. Romans actually not the part of the first chapter. Romans 1, uh, 1 through 116. Also goes into the purpose of Romans. Now we're going to get into Romans 1, 18 through 2, uh, 2, 1. Romans uh, 1, 18 through 2, 1. Um, this particular study is going to get into uh, several aspects of Romans uh, that may make some people uncomfortable. So if you're uncomfortable with promiscuity or sensuality or things like that, um, uh, you may want to just skip this one. I know for many people, um, especially in the church, who have suffered from either church abuse or spiritual abuse or um, are just not comfortable with um, things of that nature, uh, I hate to be the one to bring up any uh, trauma or post-trauma. So I'm just warning you now, uh, some of our lesson today, we'll get into some of the weeds in the text. One of the main things that's really important is that uh, for Romans 1 and for all of the talk of Romans 1 within our church today and culture, there is, um, there's a difference between what Romans 1 and 2 say and what people think it says. So as we walk through the text uh, expo uh, in an expository manner, hopefully you'll learn something and you'll see that Romans 1 should never be divorced from, the, from Romans 2. Uh, that's the first lesson. And that we should never read a part of Romans without reading the whole. And the reason why I say that is because the beauty of Romans is in the totality of Paul's writing because he's writing for a specific purpose. Let me remind you of the purpose for which Paul is writing. He's writing, one, to unite the church. Two, to, uh, to introduce himself and his understanding of the gospel. And three, to build a foundation for missions that he hopes will reach into Spain and Western Europe. So with that said, he is um, bringing together two conflicting communities in the churches in Rome. You had on the one hand Jews uh, who uh, had been excommunicated from Rome and thus the churches for a while, coming back into the church and mingling with non-Jewish Christians, or Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians. So in the churches in Rome, these two groups, the Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians, were having a bit of conflict. We can gather that if you read Romans 1, verse 16, which is Paul's purpose statement, that the power of the gospel is for salvation for everyone, for the Jews first, and also for the Gentiles, the rest of the nations. So Paul is, is trying to bring unity to the church by uniting these two uh, factions. The way he's going to do that is talk about first their common condition, uh, have them in common their common condition, then talk about their common history, then their common spiritual identity, their common future, and their common purpose. And that's the rough outline of Romans. Um, and, and let me just show you here the outline. You see the outline there of Romans. I put this as an R-rated study, but uh, I think you'll survive. Okay, there's the uh, outline of Romans. All right, with that uh, four minutes out of the way, let's jump into it, okay? The first thing we're going to start with is Romans 1, 17, which picks up right after Paul's um, purpose statement. For in it, that is the power of salvation, the righteousness or justice of God is revealed. Uh, if you're a person who writes in their Bible, you want to circle revealed because that's an important word, okay? Okay. Uh, God's righteousness is revealed, okay? Now, if God's righteousness or right standing or justice that is based on his character of holiness is revealed, whenever you, uh, whenever God's holiness and righteousness is revealed, that means that the opposite is revealed. And so we have an 18, for the wrath of God is also revealed from heaven against un ungodliness and wickedness 
of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. So if God's righteousness is revealed, that automatically sets about the contrast, which is God's wrath. Okay? You can't have a, a God, a holy God, uh, who is concerned with right standing and justice if there is a lack of wrath or judgment. So uh, Paul talks right off the bat after he finishes his purpose statement and his greetings with the, the, the fact that God reveals his holiness and righteousness and also his wrath or his judgment, the justice of God. In, uh, in theology, there are two types of, of revelation. There's what's called general revelation, okay, which is general, kind of the revelation that God reveals himself in nature, in various things like beauty, art, that general sense of spirituality that all of us are born with. The Bible affirms that each of us are born in God's image, whether we believe in God or not. And part of that God image is that idea that we know who God is instinctively. That's a general revelation. And then the second type of revelation is special revelation in which God reveals himself uh, in, in unique ways to unique people um, uh, and uh, through the Holy Spirit and through other means. So what we're talking about here is that generally um, God, in God, the power of salvation, God is revealing God's righteousness or right standing, justice, as well as wrath. And what we're going to talk about here. Uh, or what Paul's going to talk about here is the general revelation in which God reveals himself in the midst of his holiness, but that we as sinful humans turn against that. And what you're going to find in this argument and chap the rest of chapter one is, is a spiral of sin that just gets worse and worse. Uh, Paul is going to start at the very basic uh, beginning of sin, which is basically turning away from God. And then once you turn away from God, you believe yourself to be a God, and then you commit idolatry. In the ancient world, or in Paul's time, if you read the writings, for instance, uh, that Paul would have been reading, not only the Hebrew Bible, but other writings like the Wisdom of Solomon, there was a, a very fast de uh, degradation from, from turning away from God to idolatry and worshiping yourself as God or others to immorality. And then what happens in the economy in the ancient world is that immor immorality leads very quickly to promiscuity, which is the, um, the, uh, the most heinous external demonstration of sin in one's life. That's, that's how they believed. And the reason why promiscuity is in this cycle of sin, as Paul goes deeper in chapter one, is because bodies uh, reflected not only the image of God, but also defined, uh, defined uh, boundaries, okay? And you have to understand this in order to understand the Bible. Um, what kind of boundaries? Well, in a group society in which honor and shame, okay, determined your identity or your value, boundaries discern, determined honor, primarily in men or males, as aggressors, okay, as aggressors, and um, um, as aggressors, and, and primarily men as uh, the sphere of, of strength and, and providers. Uh, women, on the other hand, were symbols of, of shame um, by their passivity, okay, uh, the Bible calls it submission, or their, um, their role as, as, um, as uh, more, more tied to the domestic realm. Now, before you get on to me, again, I want to point you to our first lesson in which group um, values uh, translate into an honor and shame society uh, in which your group either had uh, honor or accrued honor or uh, you as an individual, if you brought shame upon the group, you, you would go down that social ladder. Women were automatically symbolic in, in, in bodily, uh, in, in terms of, of defining boundaries and, and within, the, um, within uh, uh, living into the space of, of who they were as people, were symbols of shame because of their passivity and their modesty, I should put, because that was the worldview at the time, okay? Um, this is what they believed was natural, and you'll see that language in a minute. 
Now, the reason why this is important is, uh, or by the way, we, we do this. Um, you may have grown up in maybe a household where, you know, a woman was acting immodestly and your grandmother might say something like, has she no shame? What does that mean? Well, if she has shame or has a sense of shame, then she would be modest, right? So we say that, oh, has, has that person no shame? Oh, it's such a, a shame. Uh, or has has that person no shame? So we we kind of have inherited that, but you have to understand the group mentality to which uh, Paul is writing and in which the the Bible is written to understand that immortality deals with bodies which have defined boundaries which they would have seen as natural. Okay, based on just the worldview. Now the reason why I say that be, is because this worldview as ancient as it is, doesn't always translate, translate into our worldview, okay? Uh, we don't really go, you know, according to, to group dynamics here in the U.S., according to honor and shame. If I become something like a career other than my father, uh, my father's career, uh, that's not a point of shame. It wouldn't bring shame on the family. Or if my wife works outside a home and is, an, is uh, assertive in her job and, and, uh, you know, uh, makes money to to get ahead, that's not seen as a, a form of shame. I mean, that's seen as a, a form of, you know, like making a living. So some of this doesn't translate, but in order to understand Romans 1, you need to understand how all of this works. And I say that at the outset because Paul is, his job right now is to unite these two factions by showing their common condition and what he's going to do is he's already called the church called ones, okay, in chapter 1, verses uh, 1 through 16. He called them saints, okay, which is uh, holy ones, called out ones. And what he's going to do here is he's going to create an us versus them paradigm, okay? We are saints and called out. They are wicked. And what he's going to do is, using ancient rhetoric, he's going to position this group in the us realm and the wicked in the them realm and he's going to unite these common factions by giving them solidarity as being saints and called ones with a common enemy the thems the wicked but he's going to do something very sneaky in chapter two and and i'm and i want you to wait on the edge of your seat to until we get there to understand how he's going to bring these two um, factions together by pointing to their common condition. But for right now, he's using us versus them language. He used the us language in Romans 1, 1 through 16. Now he's using the them language uh, in 16 through uh, 32. So let's read it. Okay. So the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. So he's already differentiating between us versus them. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. Ever since creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So they are without excuse. That's another way of saying that God works through general revelation. Uh, I encourage you to Google that. It's, it's, you know, it's something you can Google as a theological aspect of general versus special revelation. For though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Here's your key word of understanding this passage. Uh, let me grab a, a micron. All right. <clears throat> this is the key word. They did not honor him. So automatically, Paul is invoking this language of honor, okay? Honor and shame. They did not honor God. Rather, they turned away from God. So that's your first, that's your first uh, kind of digression into sin is this idea of honor and shame, not setting boundaries to know who God is and God's holiness and who you are. They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being or birds or four-footed animals or reptiles. So the first thing you do is you turn away from God. Okay, I've already shown that. And then you create gods of yourself and then step into idolatry, okay? And that's what he's talking about here. So he's going from bad to worse in this idea of, of wrath revealed against ungodliness and wickedness. Therefore, God gave them up. Uh, this idea of giving up is, is not that they're hopeless, the they's and the them's are hopeless. 
But it's it's kind of like um, I compare it to a parent and a child. You know, when I raise my child, I raise that child with my values, my ethics, try to teach that child. But eventually the child has to leave the house and that child is going to make decisions for herself. And the decisions that my child makes when she's out of the house and she's an adult are her own. I can guide her. I can give her wisdom. I can remind her who she is as my daughter. But eventually she has to find her way. And there are circumstances in which she will make decisions that I cannot control because she's an adult. And so when it says, therefore, God gave them up, it's, it's more of a release. It's not an abandonment. God never abandons his children. He always leaves a way for salvation. But eventually, God allows people to make their own decisions and to direct their own course. So God gave them up to lust um, of their hearts to impurity. So now we're getting into the heart and the body, okay? To the degrading, the word for that is, is shameful. To the shameful, to the shaming of their bodies among themselves. Uh, again, this is not unusual language in first century. Uh, um, theologians, uh, uh, rabbis, uh, like I said, you can look it up in Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 14, which is a, a book that Paul would have been reading, even though it's not scripture. Um, it is in uh, Greek um, writing and philosophy, this digression of turning from God, idolatry, and then eventually it uh, mars the boundaries, these boundaries of honor and shame that that is most demonstrated through uh, men and women and those um, those boundaries that they believe are natural. Okay. Degrading their bodies among themselves. This, by the way, is, is in terms of worship. The language is here of worship because each step is worship. You don't worship God, you worship yourself. Then you worship idols, and then you worship in a way in which you are bringing impurity uh, through shameful acts with your body. Because they exchanged, this 25, the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped, and that word is important because this is in terms of worship, okay? Because uh, that's your basic function as a human is to worship God and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason... Now, what a lot of people like to do is separate 26 and 27 from the rest of this. If you don't understand the rest of this and you separate 26 and 27, you run the risk of having this say something that means something else. So let's talk about this, okay? For this reason, meaning the worship, God gave them up, there's that phrase again, to shameful passions. Uh, the New Living Translation says shamed. They, they, uh, they were shamed. God shamed them because this word for degrading is the same word in used in this lexical kind of uh, aspect of, of honor and shame. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. You'll notice that some Bibles will say unnatural intercourse for unnatural with other women, but that's missing. Because the natural intercourse it starts with women, because in the temple worship at that time, women were used in various ways sexually. Um, because women were um, um, temple prostitutes and things like that were part of that, but unnatural uh, wasn't just natural intercourse with other women or men outside of their marriage. It was intercourse with other living things, okay? That's all I'm going to say, but I'm just saying, like, if you look up Greek worship and sexuality, uh, they did some pretty horrible things, okay, that were unnatural. The other thing about this is you're going to find this language of unnatural and natural very important because he's working off of this worldview of, of honor and shame. Okay. And in the same way, also the men giving up natural intercourse with women were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the due penalty for their ever, error. Now, this is where the shame and the honor get very important. This idea of shame and nature... All go back. All goes back to this worldview of men and women, honor and shame. If men are the aggressors and uh, strength demonstrated most clearly through their uh, conquest, not only of land or resources, but also of of women, um, who in this time were seen as those uh, who were submissive or passive or modest, then if a man took on the position of a woman by being a partner with another man, then that man would have, according to their worldview, been passive, modest, and 
taken the part of shame. So for one man to be with another man, it means that one man has to be the uh, the one who's submissive, which to Paul was unnatural. Now, if you look in 1 Corinthians 11, okay, 11, uh, 14 through 15, Paul talks about prayer in the church and prophesying in the church for women and men. One of the things he says about women is women should cover their heads in church because it was natural. And Paul gives a argument of why women should cover their heads in church because nature teaches them to do that. Why? Because if women shave their heads, they're appearing to be as men. Or if women participate in the church, uh, according to appearance, without their heads covered, they are taking the position of aggressor or a, a man's boundary. But make no mistake, in 1 Corinthians 11, women are praying and prophesying just as men are. The only thing that Paul says is that they have to keep their heads covered because it's natural. I would ask some of you, how many of you think that you need to go to church with your heads covered, ladies, because nature teaches us that that's the way to do it? Now, if you say nobody, my wife doesn't cover her head when she goes to church. We wouldn't argue these days philosophically that nature teaches us that women must cover their heads. So we're using language here that's ultimately tied to this group understanding of honor and shame. So when Paul talks about um, men giving up natural intercourse for unnatural to do shame, shameless acts, he's talking specifically about temple uh, and recreational promiscuity in which men placed other males into a permissive, um, passive position. And most often, this happened in the Greek world, between men and boys. Okay? Pederasty. Uh, the reason why we know that is because we know that boys were much a part of the uh, temple prostitution system, as were women. And men took boys and placed boys in that passive position as a form of recreation in Greece and Rome. In fact, Nero, who was the king at the time that Paul was writing, um, had a boy castrated and married him. And had him castrated so that the marriage was legitimate. I'll let you do the figuring out on that. But what I'm getting at here is that... This whole conversation is, is playing off two poles, one of a worldview of a certain digression of sin that's very specific, that's our big wheel here. Secondly, a group understanding of honor and shame and what's natural and unnatural, in which these shameful acts are not um, what we would consider um, you know, one man with another. This, this had to do more with worship and, and acts of violence or, or aggression. Uh, and pederasty, just as the women giving up natural intercourse for unnatural had probably more to do with animistic practices. And since they don't, did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up, there's that third time, to a shamed mind, that's the word debased, and another word of honor and shame, to things that should not be done. They were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness, their gossips. Slanderous, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious towards parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve, deserve to die, yet they not only do them, but they even applaud others who practice them. What I, two things that I want to give, uh, some cultural commentary. The first thing is, I know a lot of people focus on homosexuality and preach against that using this, but very few preach against things like gossip and rebellion against parents. And it's funny how we always focus on one thing and always leave the stuff that people do uh, silent. And the reason why I say that is because what Paul is doing here is he's leveling out through his worldview, uh, his particular group-based worldview, that gossip and slander and rebellion towards parents and being ruthless or foolish is just as bad as murder or strife or covetousness. Now, I want to bring you back to the close as we, we close this. He's creating an us versus them paradigm. That's what I started this off with. He's saying we're called. We're saints. Okay? That's us. And he's saying, but look at them. They're the wicked ones. Okay? They're the ones who are uh, worshiping idols and doing all sorts of, of terrible things, committing acts of violence like pederasty and all these craziness, strife and gossip. And what he's doing is he's creating an us versus them paradigm to group 
these factions into us and basically letting them to say, yeah, that's right, they're evil and we're good, we're perfect, we're awesome. But look what he does in chapter 2. He turns, he turns it right back on them. Remember, when you're pointing at someone, telling them about their sin, there are three fingers facing back at you. Therefore, you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. He just pulled the rug under you. He said, it's us versus them, but really, you're just like them through your judgment. Now, judgment in this sense is not like, you know, you're judging somebody because of their hair color. You're judging someone. In, in this word, in this particular usage, and you'll find the rest of chapter two, which we'll talk about next week, judgment is an act of excommunication, of, of condem condemnation. This, the title of this particular session is um, uh, A Common Condition. And what he's basically going to say, this is part one, what he's basically saying is that whoever you are, the factions, you share, you share one common condition, and that is that you are all sinners. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish. It doesn't matter if you're non-Jewish. You're all, your common condition is sin. So you all have something in common. You're all sinners. Even if you think you're righteous, even if you think you're doing what God wants you to do, the fact that you're judging another person based on the fact that you think you're righteous, that in and of itself is a sin. So the thing I want to leave you with as we close is that the common condition Paul starts off with is sin. How does he unite two factious groups? He basically says, all y'all are sinning. You may be doing something right. You may be doing something wrong. But the fact that you're judging another is in, in and of itself sin on the same level of all of these other things.